So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am here with Danny Mishek, who is joining me from the US. And Danny is part of a family-owned business called Vistatech, which is a manufacturing business. Welcome, Danny. Thank you. I appreciate uh, being on. This is exciting. It's my first, my first, my first podcast. Is it? Oh, exciting! It I didn't realize. Oh, fantastic! Look, I'm really pleased to have you on here. We just had a quick chat before we started the, the record thing, and I know you've got a fascinating story to tell. So, really looking forward to hearing more about it. What I'd like to do before we get started, just so the listeners can get a bit of an understanding of who Danny is, could you share with me your professional and your personal best so far in your Sh- life? Sure. Professional best, I would say, I'm having awesome meetings. I think I'm having awesome meetings with my with my employees and the customers. So it's uh, we're really seeing some some really good heartfelt meetings that are getting really good results. So that's my personal best or my professional best. My personal best, I kind of have two. And one, I got my first book published, which was not ever part of my plan. Um, so that's been tremendous. I sold a thousand books in 10 days, which I was, thought I was just trying to make 20 for my family. But also the other like, personal best, I wrote a real bull last weekend in arizona a bull. so i not a mechanical a bull. bull a real bull not a mechanical bull a real bull and so I, I can't i'd be remiss if i didn't say i rode a real bull uh, i did not stand very long but no. i did it so that was awesome that's fantastic. I actually rode a mechanical bull over in Dallas. That was my first time ever. And similarly, I looked at that. This looks really easy. I got on there. I think it was there for about two seconds. And that was it. And I'm a horse rider. But anyway, that's really cool. Yeah, I was so scared where uh, they gave me all those instructions. And then the, yeah. the, the corral opened up and I blacked out. Next thing I know, I was on the ground and I was cheering. <laughs> So it happened really fast. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I'm pleased you got to do it. That sounds great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about your business. Um, and what I understand that your business is a family owned business, but in the business, in the, in the family for generations, right? So it was your grandfather. So actually my parents started the business in 1996, okay. uh, yeah. both my grandparents and parents have both been in manufacturing. So me personally, I'm a third generation manufacturer, yeah. but Vistatech is two generations. Okay. And you um, were not trained in manufacturing or anything before joining the family business. Is that right? I was not trained educationally, but breakfast conversations, lunch conversations, dinner conversations, 4th of July conversations, fishing in the boat conversations revolved around making things, manufacturing, the importance of making things. So, yes, I've been around it a whole, of a whole lot. Yeah. So what caused you to come into the business? Like what what was the sort of, the, the, I don't know, the, the moment where you went, oh, I'm going to join the family business? Yeah, you know, it was never really intended to join the family business, but my father called me looking for a new salesperson. He asked if I had any friends. And I asked, you know, kind of what what it all entailed. And I was selling metal and plastic containers from Minneapolis to Montana. And I was looking for a change. I said, actually, Dad, I think it'd be a good fit for me to come on. He's like, I don't want a family-owned business. <laughs> so long story short, I was hired and now became a family business. <laughs> so, <laughs> Excellent. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's an interesting way to get into it. And how did you find it? Because, you know, you obviously gone from working for someone to now being part of the family business. What was the, what were the main differences for you? Uh, well, it's right away. You, you have to change the titles and what you call people. You know, I used to you know, call somebody mom or dad. Um, that doesn't go as well in a conference room you know, because <laughs> once you tell, you know, this is, Hey brother or sister or mom or dad, you've somehow elevated or de-elevated someone in the room because of the, 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 the tradition of mothers and fathers, sons and daughters. So you start after calling your parents by the first name, which is one of the first things that's, it's kind of weird to do when, you know, Hey Jim you know, or Lori instead of mom or dad, but those are, that's a, a, an easy transition, but it was awkward at first. That's right. Yeah, I hadn't even considered that. That's, that's interesting. And so um, your role in the business now? I am now president uh, and lead the day-to-day operations, um, but I have an awesome team that that do the sales and marketing, that do the operations, that do the accounting. Um, you know, EOS allows you to get to those those three those three peers, yeah. the pillars to have other people run those for you. That's true. So you are an EOS run company and you've been doing this for three years now. Is that right? Yeah, we'll be finishing up our third year in in February. Oh, that's fantastic. So so why EOS and how did you come across EOS? EOS was our accountant. Um, he kept mentioning this and I read the book um, uh, probably five to six, seven years ago. But reading the book and understanding, implementing it is different. Yes. So I read it. I love the concept. but I had no no way of how do you do it? You know, and so just because you're a good baseball player doesn't mean you're a good baseball manager. And so 
Um, I might have had a good arm and, and a good at bat, but I didn't know, I didn't know, you know, what this, what this, what the scheming or the, the planning was in that. So um, we, we brought a coach on when, when the ownership changed, I became 50% owner and we brought the other family in. Um, we thought it was really good to make sure we, we, we understood and we all understood our, our, our four core values and understand um, potential business conflicts and, and, and how to work through those and just get, we needed more tools in the toolbox. And this was an amazing way of doing that yeah. from that standpoint. Okay. So let's just go back a couple of steps. You brought some, another family into the business. How did that come about? You know, I just think with the opportunity, uh, my brother and I were, my brother's one still, he's at works here. He's one of my, my, my best employees. Um, it just, it was just time for a change. And I think we need some, 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 some different funding to help us take some opportunities that we just didn't, we couldn't do it ourselves. Yeah. And so it was, it was a really a good fit for us to, where our vision was and where we, what we need to do it. It was a, a good transition. And so just to talk for the reader's benefits, it listens benefit. So you were um, already doing EOS or you brought EOS in after you joined the companies? Yeah, together? we did EOS after the, the, the merger. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Okay. And so you talked about the sort of four core values, and that's obviously a very key part of EOS is being really clear about what they are, living and breathing, hiring, firing, rewarding, et cetera. Um, what are your four core values? Well, our four core values are hospitality, character, innovation, and get shit done, meaning do your job. And so uh, those, when I, when I think we know we reevaluate them every six months, every year, like, oh, should they change? And but how we have those with the hospitality, when somebody comes to visit us, we we'll make sure there's a beverage in the cooler for them and coffee and a clean facility. But character is not about, yeah, being honest and loyal and, and trustworthy, but character is if you do something, if you ride a bull, share it. Like have a, if you if you are, I'm I'm attracted to characters. And so whether you go gemstoning, whether you make jewelry, whether you ride a bull, whatever, share it. And then you might have more similarities with people. Innovation, you can't be in manufacturing without making innovation important. You know, we don't just compete in the Midwest or in the US, we compete in the world. Mm. So you have to be innovative on a world level, not just in a Minnesota, United States level. Cool. And then get shit done, do your job. That one, when you say that, you know, when, you know, we never really used it properly of our four core values. When Sarah, I mean, she's our EOS, I don't call her a coach or she's our EOS super, like a superhero. Yeah. <laughs> but do your job um, that gets shit done. When you say that we were never using it in the hiring process. She says, you know, yeah, yeah well, people, they'll start, you know, after they hear it five to seven times. And, mm -hmm. but she goes, are you hiring? When you hire somebody in the interview process, are you mentioning your four core values? Like, no, she says, they should hear them. The first interview, second interview, the yep. onboarding, the, the, the first, you know, company meeting. But once you hire with that, I feel like once you've laid out your four core values, you now you've just laid the groundwork of expectations. Yeah. And, and if, if they're uncomfortable with that, then obviously it's not a fit right away, but you can always go back to the very first time you met. Remember, we, we talked about this. Mm. Where is this fit in innovation? Why are you doing this by hand when we have automation that can do that and you can do something else? It's so much easier to, to, to have that conversation. Yeah, I love it. And of course, you know, with innovation, we talked about in the, before we come online that you're now producing plant-based plastics as well as your traditional plastics. So, I mean, that world is just changing all the time, isn't it? It is. I mean, I'm so proud to, to be a, a manufacturer and a U.S. manufacturer to help our, our local economy, um, but to use traditional methods of manufacturing, but also evolve and use plant-based plastics to actually uh, create things that avoid landfills. Yeah. So we, we don't have to drill for oil and we don't have to put something back in the landfill. Yeah. So we can actually get something, produce something from, from uh, corn um, without taking the, the kernel and the, and the, and the, you know, we take the, the root and, the, and the, the root, the roots and the stalks and create a polymer. I mean, like this being, this my first podcast, a glass of champagne, but this is a plant-based champagne flute. So we yeah. make this here in Minnesota and, it could, when you're done, it goes in a compost bin and it turns into compost in 30 to 90 days. Right. So cheers. Cheers. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about, you know, some of the challenges you've had as a family business and how EOS has actually helped you to overcome that. I think the challenge is not just the, from the family business side is you have different dynamics with that, but we're talking, you know, trying to run this company. Uh, they've been on board for three years, but you throw a pandemic in there. Mm. So you have the transition of, 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 
getting them truly exposed to manufacturing and, and, and feed on the ground to also now third shift, um, they might have contact tracing of COVID so they can't come in. Yeah. But the machines have to have to be running. So you have to come in and, and be relevant. So you have to, how do you, how do you, how can you always, how do you, how do you always be here when you don't have to be here? Yep. So how, how has EOS helped with that in terms of your thinking or tips and tools and things that's actually helped with that? I would say um, how it's helped is to go back to the, the four core values yeah. and the, and the, um, honestly, the, the AC or the um, accountability chart. The accountability chart is, is, is magical. And, and when we first do it, you know, it's, it's an org chart. It's an org chart. No, it's an accountability chart. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter from top to down or left to right. It's wherever you look, the accountability is on that person and, and on, on him or her, whoever it is. Like this is, if something falls short, you can go to the accountability chart. Yeah, that's a really key point, isn't it? Because um, when we first start doing it with any of the clients, they go, well, it's just, they treat it like an org chart. And it's it's really quite different to that in terms of being very, very clear. Like anybody in the organization can look at it and go, that's the person who I need to speak to. But it also comes down to solving issues and things too. If you've got a, a challenge or an opportunity, um, you know exactly who is accountable for that. 100%. I felt we were having company meetings, kind of lecturing or scolding the entire company mm-hmm. when it was a department or an individual that needed to be talked to. Yes. So it made it easier to go and say, instead of bringing up all the things that happen on first shift or second shift or third shift, if it was just one person not doing their job, we can reward the other people that were doing their job. And then we can retrain and address the individual who was falling short. Yeah, that's fantastic. And you mentioned in the beginning, better meetings. Tell me about that. Or well, great meetings, Just, I think you said. Yeah, yeah, great meetings. I think going in there with a with a focus and a laser focus of having the agenda, having your to-dos and issues list, it keeps them shorter, but also keeps them relevant where you don't get hung up on some of the things. I just felt with those better meetings and bringing the core values to them and with the accountability chart, People are coming prepared because we're seeing results from meetings. Mm. Before we would have meetings and we'd not, see results so we i would always say even before the other owners came in we've always had great effort but yeah. we never got rewarded or never got the results from great effort and so now i think we're seeing the meetings turn being effort but with rewards uh with the effort and the meetings uh, i think they're precise wearing our vision is clear because of being uh, being able to um delegate and elevate so you know we had our two-day session with sarah and one of the things I said, Danny, you got to get to the office more. Go, go do what you what you're better at doing. Go be the visionary. And also in that that first Monday back, I had a coffee with a customer that we're growing with, and they've this this company is is led by this president, and she's done such an amazing job to grow through COVID. And I could have coffee with her for two hours on a Monday morning and talk about the, the growth and opportunities. Mm-hmm. And before I'd be in there, I feel like I need to be seen in the office in case I need to help with something. I can't help with something. I always say the higher up you go in the company, the dumber we get. And I'm at the top. So like, I can't help move out, get out of the way, Danny. Yeah. So it's been good. And also get back to doing what you love, right? Because you obviously love uh, those relationships and, and looking for opportunities rather than being stuck in an office worrying about whether or not the machinery is working properly. A hundred percent. I love the, 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 the sharing and caring and, and storytelling um, the things I do. I, I have a beehive. I like to garden. I like to golf. I like red wine. Those come into not selling, but but sharing the relationship and building relationships with other people. It's amazing when you have a beehive, how many people say, so how, how does, how is honey made? Yeah. You know, how, how, so how many gallons do you get from this? And pretty soon they, they feel like it's fun to talk to Danny because he's always doing something different and something that's that normal people do. <laughs> No, you're saying you're normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not normal. I'm not normal. <laughs> hey, just out of interest, had you heard of like a visionary role before you took on board EOS? Not really. I've, I've I heard of visionaries and I heard entrepreneurs. I still struggle calling myself an entrepreneur. Okay. I, I really, um, people have to tell me I'm an entrepreneur because you, there's classes for entrepreneurship. I mean, people are like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. And, oh, what do you do? I'm, I'm going to school or I'm doing this. Like, well, you might want to be an entrepreneur, but what, what do you have? I have eight patents and I don't think I'm an entrepreneur. Oh, it, it's, 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 it's weird. It's almost like, I think entrepreneurs have to have like so much more success. And, but really to get to this point, you have to fail so often to have these successes. And, and I just, I have a hard time forgetting the times I failed 
Yep. I hold it on. I almost, I almost had like a crutch, but really if I didn't have failed, if I wouldn't have failed at that part, I wouldn't have been up here developing products with, with plant-based plastics and garden pots you can plant in the ground and mm -hmm. they, and, and it feeds the roots. Like these are things that we're working on, but I failed in 2014, the first try at it. Yep. But now I, I'm bringing it to market this year. It certainly sounds pretty entrepreneurial to me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. And you've also, you, you mentioned earlier, but you actually took on board something completely new this year. And I can see it in the background there. So you had yes. a New Year's resolution. Tell us a bit about that. Well, all my other New Year resolutions that I make have failed because all revolve around losing weight. And I, I just can't do it. I don't do it or I don't try hard enough. Yep. Um, but this year being with the social unrest um, in Minneapolis and the divisive, um, political landscape of the election and COVID, I just felt those, the darkness was really coming in on me personally. Mm -hmm. And it was really hard to, that, to be locked down. And it was difficult to see people post something on social media that just, well, I, I care, like, and love some of these people, friends and family. And I was find myself really not liking people. And so I told my wife, I'm going to get up social media for 30 days. And I did. So I woke up the next morning on New Year's Day, 2021. And I went to grab my phone and I'm like, no, nope. I said, I wasn't going to do that. So I found myself with all this extra free time. And so I started to read a couple of books. Uh, I don't love reading, but I started reading some books, but I decided to finally write a book. And I've always wanted to write a book about the importance of decorating a Christmas tree, at least in my opinion. Yep. And uh, it was fun to put down um, thoughts that I've been blessed with, with my family and as a child with my grandparents and parents, but I want to make sure this was an all-inclusive book that it wasn't my Christmas story. Mm -hmm. This was like something that everyone gets into the holidays. Once the, the December 1st comes along, you turn your calendar page and you just see everything already filled and, and the stress and the anxiety, but there's so much love and, and care and sharing and festivities that go with that. But some get overwhelmed with all that. And so to me, I feel like I have four children, two in college, two in high school. And I feel like this was my, my one hour a year that I get a chance to um, decorate the tree with my kids. Mm -hmm. The kids can't have friends over. They, they, they know they have to be home. Um, my wife brings all the decorations out. And as we all have looked at all the ornaments, we say, is there room on the tree? Where do these go? And then people, what, what are we going to drink? So hot chocolate with big marshmallows or a bourbon for dad, a glass of wine for mom. And then we fight for the music. Is it going to be a Western country, country, Western music tonight? Or is it John Muppet or John Denver and the Muppets? Is it, you know, gospel music? But when you get all done, um, it feels like as you pull up ornaments, every time we travel somewhere, we pull, we buy an ornament. Mm -hmm. So you're almost unpacking your life every year from when you went to Napa Valley or you went to uh, Barcelona, Spain, or these pla places you've been, or a first grade teacher gave this to you. And you just, you that for that hour, to me, I think it reminds us how blessed we are. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you cut the tree down from a farm, you put up from, from, from plastic, if it's a, a, a fake tree, but your story is your story. There's no right way to celebrate that time of the year. But what I'm trying to do is get people to slow down and to celebrate yeah. Uh, that time of the year. Actually, it's been really interesting because last we've been in lockdown for I mean, a couple of years on and off over in New Zealand as well. And last Christmas, I actually didn't put up a Christmas tree. It's probably the first year ever. And it was because we were, uh, there was all sorts of stuff going on. And now when I hear you talking about this, I remember I'm exactly like you. I buy an ornament for each new family member. Yes everywhere we go to um it has to match color wise as i'm very anal about that but you know <laughs> and it's true there's this real joy when you pull it all out and start to look at those things and it's like the gratitude of oh that's right we had the most amazing time there or oh you know hermes our new puppy joined us last year and and so this 100%. year i've actually ordered hermes a, a, a bauble and I'm, I'm putting a christmas tree up but what's the book yeah. called uh, it's called the christmas tree story not yeah. very original um, but what was fun is I thought my journey was always about writing the book. Yep. Um, I love to share stories. I never really cared about or thought about being an author, but to share the story is more rewarding than actually writing the story. And as I tell people, and in the book, there's there's little Easter eggs in the book that reflects upon my family or my experience. But there's there's a story when our kids were first born. I drive by this this uh, this tree farm and is like a tree lot, and they're already pre cut, and it was called Jolly Jacks. And I drive by there. We'd have snow on Tuesday, but the snow would still be on the trees on Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. So I know that they weren't cut fresh every day, but I'd see them. And finally, it was 
we try to wait a couple weeks before Christmas. And so we finally go up there and, and say, all right, Jack, we need a, need a tree. And I said, how, how often are these cut? He looked at me, he says, they're cut fresh every day. And I'm like, well, I drive by here every day. So I know that if it snowed Tuesday and there's still snow on the tree on Saturday, it wasn't cut today, you know, but he looked at me and said, so every year would go back and he'd always, and I, I, my wife would say, don't ask him. I'd say, hey, hey, Jack, how often is this cut? He was cut fresh every day. So, but it was like an open lie, but I accepted it and it was okay. And then the big thing was the person in front of us near the, near the tree top on the top of the, the car. And Jack would say, how far are you going? And the guy would say, I'm going seven miles. He said, I'll give you the seven mile tie. And I always kind of laughed about that. And then like he says, all right, how far are you going, my friend? I said, I'm going two miles. He said, then I'll give you a two mile tie. So I was able to put that little story in just a stanza that says this, a local lot for us, Jolly Jacks was its name. We ventured down each row, no tree was the same. Claim cut fresh each day, which I knew was a lie on the roof that got home with Jack's two mile tie. It was so fun to be able to put a story into just a stanza, but have it be meaning for me. But when I share that story, nine out of 10 people tell me their story of they went to a tree farm or they'd go with grandma or they'll go with dad. And it's so fun because now we're not talking about wearing a mask. We're not talking about vaccinated. We're not talking about political unrest. We're not talking about all these things. We're talking about tradition and a happier time. Yeah. So it's been so rewarding for me to get out of the office because people are doing their job and people are delegating and elevating and I could write a book. It's been amazing. That is amazing. Hey, I'm really curious. It's going a little bit off topic, but in terms of getting off social media for 30 days, how hard was that? Because I must admit, I've got to the point where I'm getting really quite tired of the stuff that I'm seeing on social media. I know it's doing me no good, um, but I, I must admit, I'm a little bit, you know, um, what's the right word? Addicted to my phone, I think is probably the right word. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It, it, it was difficult, but after the, I would say after 48 hours, mm -hmm. I realized what I was missing was nothing relevant. Yeah. I wasn't, because you find yourself scrolling and, and caring about things you should not care about. And, and so um, it was hard. So I turn my, I still now have my alerts off and I will check it over lunch or in the evening, but I have not, I'm not a slave to, to social media. Now I, I always felt I had to be, you know, quick to reply. If somebody replied to, to me and stuff, I realized it just doesn't matter. People are not judging you on your activity on social media. Mm -hmm. And so also now I, I have more engaging conversations with my wife, my family, my employees. Um, yeah. But now I need social media to sell my book. But it's 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 managed accordingly, and from there, you know, it's like when I wrote the bull and posted on on Instagram and social media. I mean, it was fun for people to see that, and it was fun to get their comments. But that doesn't define who I am or define who my friends are. Yeah. So you have to kind of put in perspective of like it should be one of one of the things that helps you get through life, not the only thing that drives your life. So that makes perfect sense. I love it. Yeah, I must admit, I turned off the notifications on the phone, and even that makes a difference because that little red circle that used to pop up with the numbers, it was almost like, a, oh, I have to see somebody, somebody's commented or somebody's done something. And it, even with emails, yes. I know I've done the same with my emails as well. I just think it makes a big difference. 100%. Wow. I'm so pleased for you. I think it's a fantastic, you know, and that's the power, I guess, to my mind of EOS, particularly in family business, but in any business is just being very, very clear about who does what, making sure you're doing the things that are the things you are really great at and freeing up that time to do the things, the other passions in life, because we all have those other passions. A hundred percent. I totally agree. Yeah. Hey, look, I could talk to you all day, but we do try and keep these to us on a certain time frame. And unfortunately sure. that's running out. Could you, before we go, share um, three tips or tools or things with our listeners that have really helped you in your life? I mean, professionally and personally, it doesn't matter, um, but just three things that you'd like to share. And then I'd love for you to tell us where they can get the book as well. Sure. Thank you. I, I do think that um, looking, try to look through other people's lenses. I think that helped me a lot in writing the book. I used an illustrator who did an amazing job. Her name is Megan Shumway. Um, she, she put uh, a person in a wheelchair, people with different skin color tones like this. So no matter who looks at this book, it's through, through their lens. They can see what they want to see. So when you make decisions for your, you know, for your employees, for your vendors, what are they looking at through their eyes? Some people get excited about the holidays because they get to travel. Other people, it, it's, 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 it's heartbreaking because they're trying if the bills go up, you know, so like what, what's like through their, their lens. I recommend that. Yep. Um, I would, I would say, um, get out of your comfort zone. I, I've had more success being uncomfortable 
and getting out of my comfort zone to so it widens it. So when somebody thinks they're they're going to bring an uncomfortable situation to you, they're like that's not very uncomfortable. So you can deal with it easier. And when you get out of your when you get out of your comfort zone, share that with people. Share your personality, your character. Because man, I it's been so fun to talk to people about my book, but it's grown into other relationships. And people want to know what how 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 uh, how does it have a beehive and and to write a book to to be self published. They want to know what manufacturing and the manufacturing. There's not that many of us in the U.S. So people say, "Oh, you make something? How? How does that work? What kind of schooling do you need? Do you take? Do you have internships? You know." So, I just think being different and being out there and sharing that you're different. Everybody's trying to be the same. Don't be the same. Mm-hmm. Be who you are, but then share it loud and proud. So then people say, "How? How is it? How is it being that way?" Yes. Share that part of it. I love that. And I think it helps to build resilience as well. As you said before, you know, the, the things, if you go and try things out of your comfort zone, you're going to have some failures without a doubt, but you bounce back from those and suddenly don't, nothing seems hard anymore. I totally agree. I, I, I've been talking to people as when, when it's, it's kind of odd to have people come and talk to you and you have to share your failures, but that's what gets them excited because of the successes that come after it. Yeah. Failing is learning. So just, just learn a bunch, just but learn fast. My father, he would tell us if you're going to fail, fail fast and fail cheap. If you have long fail that costs a lot of money, you you have you have a hard time to succeed after or have a success after that. So yeah. fail fast and then fail fail cheap. <laughs> Love it. And a third and final tip for us, Danny. Um, I think those last two were kind of there, but I would say just be true to yourself. Yeah. Um, if you have your core values, you should have the business ones and, and your personal ones, but just be true to yourself. Uh, if you know what your if your intentions are pure. And we're all going to make mistakes, but if you have good intentions, people are going to understand when you have to apologize, they'll say, yeah, I get it. You screwed up, but you owned it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'd say as long as you're you're transparent and with good intentions, you're going to go far in life. Fantastic. That's great. And so your book, really keen. How can we get hold of your book if we'd like to get a copy? So it is on Barnes & Noble uh, for pre-order. Uh, they're shipping in November 1st. So Barnes & Noble, uh, Amazon, Target.com, and then DannyMishik.com. I'm selling them myself uh, from there. So it's been really exciting, a heck of a heck of a journey for me uh, for, for this, but it's been really rewarding. And I have to say, if I have one more minute, Sarah Stern, who is our biz- who's my you know EOS coach, business coach, I asked her to come to my house and read the first copy before it was hardcover because I really struggled if I should do something more with it. Because when you go to self-publishing, it costs a lot of money and I wasn't sure if I could really sell what I need to sell. So I had her come over. I mixed her a cocktail. I said, Sarah, I need your opinion. I need you to uh, let me know is this should be, should this be 20 copies for my family and say, like, look, Danny, you, you wrote a book for your kids and that's cute. Yep. Or should there be something more? And my wife's always been supportive, but you know, here's another journey of how many more thousand dollars to publish yourself. And she read the book. She read it a second time. And she says, I don't think your wife's going to like me. I think you should do more with this. Mm-hmm. And so with that, it gave me the confidence to do that. But she also, she bought the first 30 books to promote to her businesses. Like here's something for the holidays. And I know the author and local but she, after I gave her, when they came from the, uh, from the, the publisher, I gave her the 30 bucks and she told me, she was, Danny, I came 95% prepared to tell you, don't go all in on the book. Oh. Like she almost came prepared to break up with me, oh. you know? And, 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 but after she read it twice, she's like, you gotta do something more with this. This is more special than just 20 bucks for your, for your family. Mm-hmm. And, but I love that she came prepared to, you know, to, 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 to let me down. I was like, you're not an author move on don't worry about it but she 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 was honest she's like no you gotta do more so i just i thank her for 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 part of my journey and that's how we got to here with you and Absolutely. this journey this journey has been amazing and, and thank you for letting me share it it's been oh my it's a pleasure and i have to also thank sarah i mean sarah and i share a common interest we're both really passionate about family businesses and i reached out to her and obviously and said have you got anybody who we could come on and talk about it and she immediately thought of you which is great and um very very grateful for for the introduction so thank you sarah if you're listening it's fantastic yeah. Hey, Danny, it's been an absolute pleasure. I really could talk to you for hours and I'm very hopeful that, you know, when we get to traveling again, I can come visit you and see your manufacturing plant and and also meet the family. But that'd be fantastic, Deborah. We'd we'd love love, love to have you on. I'd love to. So in the meantime, please look after yourself. Thank you so much for your time. Um, Look forward to talking to you. So just a a quick reminder. So dannymishik.com is where they can find the book, as well as all the, the major retailers. And I guess if anybody wants to have a chat to you about family business, you'd be okay for them to get in contact with you? 
Absolutely. 100%. Oh, that's fantastic. Hey, look, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers.